Well, it's turn 14, and this turn we don't have a lot to say. We've completed some researches, which is mostly just tidying up a few of the level 0 researches that I wanted to get out of the way. We've also had our scout successfully ping a throne province, so we now know that there are three ghouls, a sorcerer and two wizards, and a shitload of other ghouls. Uh, just a ton of undead in this province. These wizards seem focused on summoning more units, undead or phantasmal warriors and so on, so this might actually be a relatively easy throne to take. I'm going to save a screenshot of this for later so that I can check back onto it if I need to. A lot of players actually save copies of their turns, but I'm really bad at remembering to do it every turn, which means that I can't, you know, load up an old save file of the same multiplayer game and check what my, what my information was. I've also had some bad luck because we just are going to be getting lots of bad luck, generally speaking. And so, on to the orders for this turn. I'm hopefully going to be able to retake this province before Scalaria try and sneak in. Other than that, it's mostly inconsequential troop movements and some scouting. We're spreading our scouts a bit further throughout the world. I really want to find out who's to my north, northwest and northeast. And we're also continuing to recruit just a shitload of wolf, rider, wolf riders. Almost everywhere that I can, I'm recruiting wolf riders right now. This is for a couple different reasons. One is that if I go to war with Uruk, he has a lot of relatively lightly defended provinces. 40 wolf riders can take out a lot of troops. And because they're stealthy, this means that I can do stealth raiding. There is a raiding mechanic built into the game called pillaging, but nobody ever uses it because it's basically useless and ineffective. Instead, what the player community terms as raiding basically boils down to snatching provinces real quick. There's a few different ways to do raiding, and um, we'll probably end up using all of them throughout this match. Because, you, you know, you can have a secondary small army wandering around near your main army taking taking lightly defended provinces. Or, you know, if you have thugs or super combatants, which are, which are extremely strong individual units, you know, if you have a guy who can take a province by himself, you might as well have him march around by himself taking provinces. Another method is the, uh, the stealth raid, which is what I'm planning to use against Uruk. Which is where, if you have stealthy commanders and stealthy units, you can sneak forces into enemy provinces, assess which are the weakest provinces, and then later, on, on one turn, you can declare like four different stealth attackers to attack and, and claim four of your opponent's provinces in one swoop. This is really disheartening for the opponent, and can represent a pretty significant swing in cash reserves or material being transported to important recruiting sites, if you happen to do it right. So I'm probably going to sp send a few um, stealthy scouting parties to look around in his territory, identify places to send stealthy attack groups, and then uh, later, when we're ready to move into his territory, we'll toggle those guys to attack the provinces they're currently in, which will be bad for him and good for me. Other than that, we're sort of consolidating some units and continuing to spread our infrastructure. We're going to start building a palisade here, and my second Veti Hag I'm sending up to this province to build a lab to start recruiting more hags. Then we'll probably plonk a fort down in here next turn as well, and definitely get a lab here afterwards as well to start recruiting Lizard Shaman, because let me just let me just show you these guys, because they're great, okay? So these are independent spellcasters. They cost 115 gold, which is the average amount for a, a decent wizard, I think. But they are sacred, and the basic benefit of being sacred is that they only have half upkeep costs which means that it's way cheaper to keep a whole big stack of these guys around than most other kinds of mages, especially considering you can use them as cheap fodder for communions. But there's also a lot of effective nature spells to cast in battle anyway, so if you're going to be using communions for these guys, there's a lot they can do. It's also interesting that this guy has d decided to just leave a huge part of his army here. It might only be 20 units, but Maidens of the Moon are his powerful sacreds, and Mushu, uh, Masushu chariots are those incredibly powerful, incredibly expensive dragon units. If they're sitting here, that means he's worried I'm going to invade. They should be doing anything other than sitting here being a waste of space, basically. If there's any other independent provinces in this entire area, he should be moving them towards that. Or he should be linking them up with a greater force in order to try and take a throne. So I think he's got them sitting here just because he doesn't want me to take this province. Oh, and just as a side note following up on the last turn, there is actually a fourth way to gain access to communions, which is to use magic items. There is a master matrix and slave matrix item which can be created using earth and astral gems together, uh, which will automatically cast the relevant spells on the units holding them at the start of a battle, which means that you can essentially use anything as... Uh, use any kind of commander as fuel for a communion if you want to, provided you have the capacity to manufacture those. Well, it's another turn, it's a new day, it's raining incredibly heavily outside, and we've discovered our first magic site. 
It's a pretty decent one. It's low level. It gives us one Astral Pearl per turn, which will come in handy, but not also, but also not be amazing. We've also had an easy time recapturing this province from the random troops that decided to have an uprising there, and we've had an incredibly bad luck event. We've lost 11 water gems thanks to this random event, and that's pretty much wiped out our entire treasury. We've only been getting, I think, one per turn so far, so that's a significant loss. And that's actually a contributing factor to why I've decided to switch production from Gigas to Scrati in the capital. They take twice as long to recruit, but they are our only water spellcasters that we have, we'll be having at the moment. So the first one of these I'll be sending out to also start site searching because we're going to need to boost our water income, I think. It's not the most efficient use of him, but I think it's probably the best option for me right now. In the next couple turns, a couple of our forts will be finished building, and those should be able to recruit Gigias, hopefully. Unless I have made some kind of terrible mistake about which places can build which kind of units. There's not a great deal left to say. I know this is a complicated looking turn in terms of unit orders, but it's mostly just logist logistical shuffling. The interminable bureaucracy of trying to run an empire. So, in that case, what are the important things to talk about? Well, my scouts are continuing to push out into the world, and I now know that my northwestern player is probably Phalegra. Phalegra are themed around ancient Sparta, but also around the sort of underworld giants of of that mythology. In this era, they've become corrupted to some extent, and they're not the like noble colossi that they once were, and are now sort of like weird, fucked up half giants and snake legged guys, and like all of the all of the really weird shit you get in Greek mythology. On a similar note, we've uh, we've recaptured this province from the the salty sea dogs who attacked it, but it's worth spotting this out. It looks like Nabar have taken this province from Scalaria. I don't know whether that means they've gone to war with Scalaria or if this is just a border conflict and they're pushing pushing back against one another a little bit. There's no kind of formal definition of any of these things. It's just what players choose to call stuff. I forgot to describe them when I recorded this, but Nabar is based on Arabic folklore and myth, with a focus on jinn and the endless trackless desert. It's worth pointing out and praising that Illwinter, the game's developers, have tried to go to actual mythological sources rather than relying on potentially uncomfortable cliches from Arabic-themed elements of Western fantasy. They clearly try and be good about that sort of thing. But if he has gone to war, that's interesting, both because that actually provides me a safe buffer between me and Scalaria, since I can't actually have any direct contact with him anymore, but on the other hand, players do trade territory sometimes. It's not impossible that he made a successful argument and bought this territory off the other player for, you know, gems or some kind of um, military alliance or, or even just gold or anything, really, you know. That's one of the fun things about this game. Pretty much anything is possible that you can think of to do is possible to do. Which means that I now have a solid protected border to both my east and my west. To the south, I mean, these guys are fish people. They don't like being on the land... So I can generally ignore them. I have actually reached out to them for an uh, for a an non-aggression pact because I do not trust having this guy so close to my territory, especially not my single most valuable province by far. If he if he if he takes this province, every everything I have will be directed against him. Every hand will turn against him. All of my vaunted power will be devoted to bringing this dipshit down. But hopefully, that's not what's going to happen. On the other hand, he hasn't responded to my diplomatic overtures, so maybe he is planning to do something like that. Which means that my war planning for um, causing problems in the north perhaps need to be redirected. Regardless, I'm still going to be working on my plans for war with Uruk, which at this stage are mostly just continuing to build up my wizard base and also prepping stealthy assault teams. Basically, my plan will be to get a couple of armies online with decent communions set up in order to start doing skeleton spam, and also I want to have two or three, maybe even more, secret sneaky armies of wolf riders already snuck into his territory, and the moment I actually mobilize against him, they will flip critical provinces with, with low province defense, and uh, that should cut into his income and make life a lot harder for him. But that's still for the future, we're still just in the planning stages. I, I have a couple of groups nearly ready for that, actually. Next turn, this castle will be, will be completed, and then I think the turn after, this one will be completed. Or it might be a little bit longer. But yeah, the only other thing to mention is that we are continuing to generate scouts and send them out. We are continuing to generate. We are continuing to generate wizards and have them research. We are also going to start blood searching next turn. I'm sending a couple of geekers to a couple of provinces that should be juicy, and full of delicious red fluids. And in the next couple of turns, I want to try and ping these two throne provinces to just see exactly what's in there and what they can do. And that is basically everything that's happening this turn. 
Well, here we are on what is turn probably 15, and there's not really much to talk about. We've had our first throne claimed. This is surprisingly early for a throne claim, but then some thrones are quite lightly defended. We've also had an unexpected event. A witch has been stoned to death, which is a nasty way to go, but then, you know, <laughs> if she was going to be uttering dark curses over the land anyway, I suppose she deserved it. Please note, this does not represent my actual political opinion on witches or dark curses covering the land. We've also completed our first fortress. So, that means this province will now have more recruitment points for commanders, and I think possibly more recruitment points overall. That number will go up as we build our fortress, but since we now have access to Gigas here, and they take the same amount of time to recruit as the Veti Hags, there's no reason not to switch over production. Beyond that, there's just a whole lot of logistical shuffling around. I have now successfully secured an NAP with Pelagia, which means I can just ignore my southern flank entirely. My NAPs to the east and west mean I, I can not worry about those flanks, but that doesn't mean I can ignore them because, of course, they are more likely to attack me than Pelagia. Pelagia being underwater and having an NAP basically means I don't have to worry about them for the next, like, 20 turns at least. Which means I can freely focus my myself on the war effort. To wit, I'm continuing to recruit troops where I'm recruiting troops. I'm continuing to prepare and set up my, my raiding teams, which will be consisting of a wolf rider commander and 40 wolves under his command. I'm also building a second lab here to begin recruiting Betty Hags there. I don't ever plan to build a fortress in this province, so I'll probably send those hags here. So I'll lose the first turn of their research, but then they'll be in a nice safe fortress when I eventually build one here, which I'll probably start building next turn. Our Scrat here has uh, been half constructed. He'll be finished at the end of this turn, ready to use next turn to start site searching for water so that we can start rebuilding our water treasury. In addition, next turn I might pause major recruitment for one turn just to recruit some commanders. I don't actually have any additional commanders other than the wolf riders to, to lead my troops at the moment, so I'd like to get some decent powerful commanders down next turn. All of these guys are one commander point, which means I can actually recruit two of them in one turn, so I think it's worth sacrificing a turn to do that. Especially considering these guys, in fact all of my, all of my commanders are priests, or sacred, which means that to recruit them you have to have a temple in the province. At the moment I only have a temple in my capital, and I only have one priest who is busy commanding troops, which means that I can't get a priest here to build a temple to recruit the guys, so it'll just be really convenient for me if I recruit a guy here and have him command and the other guy march around building temples, which will be necessary as we continue to expand. So I'm looking forward to having two or three wolf rider teams ready to go, sneaking their way through my opponent's territory. I want to get them into position before I move up my main army to start grabbing his provinces, but the plan will be to have one or two armies in position, then have them take one of these provinces at the same time as three other provinces are taken by wolf riders, which should be a pretty devastating first turn of a war. Since I will have that many mobile troops moving around, it's to my advantage to simply take a territory and move on, and I should be able to seize territory faster than he can take it back, which means both that he'll be splitting his forces in order to retake that territory, and he'll have less money income with which to build his forces anyway. Beyond that, we're continuing to scout, and we now know the locations of almost every other nation. There's only two that we're still confused about. I think that next turn I'll give a little overview of where everybody is, but there's one other definite confirmed location, which is Katis over here, which is a nation of lizard men. They live in swamps and their dominion spreads diseases, but they are cold blooded, which means that they are going to be trying very hard not to fight into our dominion because if you have cold blood and you're in cold weather, you can't do shit. Finally, I just want to check what the throne that has been taken does. You can see this, everyone can see this list of all of the thrones in the world and how many points they're worth. And if you click on them, you can see what they do. So, as you can see, this one spreads dominion, which I think all thrones do. It also produces some gems, which most thrones do, and it unlocks recruitment of a crystal mage. These guys are actually really good. They're one of the better independent mages available. As you can see, they have decent paths, and the combination of earth and astral is a really strong option, which unlocks a lot of very useful items for construction. They're also very solid researchers, although they do have the downside of being old age. So, that's everything I want to go over for this turn. So here we are on turn 17 and we have some good news and some good news. First up we have another magic site found, this is a decent one. Our blood slave hunters have also begun to inflict the red tax on the populace and uh, have done so very efficiently. Interestingly, we both had a fortune teller blocker negative event and also 
predict a major event. I believe there's a chance that any global event can be foreseen by by units with the fortune telling trait. And what she has foreseen is the arena, which is a really interesting mechanic in the game, which is implemented quite poorly unless you happen to have a rebalancing mod for the arena, which most multiplayer matches use. However, this one doesn't, which means that I will not be sending an applicant to the arena and I will simply explain it later when it happens. We also had our scout ping go oddly. So unfortunately, our scout died. He didn't make it out of the province on time. Oh, what's that? How interesting. This guy has had negative one deaths amongst his wolf rider chieftains. How curious, how fascinating, what an odd thing to happen. So essentially what happened here was that um, I pinged this province successfully. He turned up, turned around immediately to leave. However, in the one turn that he had to run across the battlefield, the Netter of Kings cast a spell called Enslave, which um, flipped him to the other side. So now he just lives here. I love the idea of this enormous giant standing on the other side of the battlefield as this one wolf rider trots up, turns around, begins to leave, and then the guy's just like, We'll give you dental. And this miserable little goblin fellow on his on his wolf is like, Actually, that's a pretty good deal. I don't get de dental and neither does my wolf. Anyway, that's all of the updates we have here. Time to talk about geography. So the geopolitical landscape is much as it was, but we've got some interesting changes. First off, we now know that Falegra is over here to my northwest, which means... That to my northeast must be the dominion of man. Over here we have Ashdod. As I had predicted, this is where they live. Ashdod's whole deal is that they are themed around ancient Mesopotamian peoples. They're basically the bad guys from, from Old Testament Bible stories. Large horned giants with a certain amount of blood and fire magic and, uh, you know, deserty aesthetics. Man is Arthurian themed. They have sort of druidy wizard guys, and they also have a lot of, you know, knights of the round table, and they have especially good longbowmen. They're one of the few nations that have decent ranged attackers. But the most important thing I've noticed is that the fishmen now have a foothold on land. This is generally a bad idea. Underwater nations are very powerful, which is why there's usually only one per game, maybe two. Primarily because it's very difficult for land units to fight underwater for the simple reason that they are underwater. Like, considering how many things this game factors into every single one of its simulations, people underwater just are bad at moving underwater, and their armor rusts, and they get tired quickly, and it sucks. Being underwater sucks. It doesn't matter if you give them magic to let them breathe down there, they're still having trouble moving around, which means that, you know, underwater units will win underwater fights pretty decisively, which means that underwater nations are the only nations who have a basically perfectly defensible homeland. Which is also why it's bad for them to get a foothold on the land. I assumed that he'd actually gone to war with Uruk and taken this territory from Uruk, but apparently, when I phoned him up, you know, on the old crystal ball, and said, um, hey, I notice you're pushing into Uruk's territory, do you want to agree on a nice dividing line between them so that we can carve them up neatly? He actually said, uh, no, I'm kind of actually chill with Uruk, Uruk is letting me stay on the land so long as I fight Scalaria. Which is interesting. Scalaria is one of the most snowbally nations in the game. They are very dangerous and often banned. And in fact, Scalaria messaged me asking me to go to war with Nabar because Nabar was pushing into Scalaria's territory from the north. And I said, basically, that's tempting. I'd like more territory, but I don't really want to help help the snowballiest nation in the game to snowball early. It's very common for Scalaria to just be pushed out of the game quite early, which is clearly what's happening right now, being attacked from both north and south simultaneously. So let's move on to our orders for this turn. So my plans haven't changed. I'm still building up my forces with the intent of pushing into Uruk. However, I'm, I was thinking about speeding that up if Pelagia wanted to wanted to join in and divide his territory up between the two of us. However, he's declined, so I'm just going to continue building my forces for a couple turns. I'm even thinking about trying to take some of these thrones early, which is why I've been pinging the provinces. But while this one should be easy to take once I've got so my death mages set up to cast anti undead spells, which they have. After all, you know, what Erna can make, Erna can unmake. My blood hunters, I'm gonna just leave to continue blood hunting, but for a while, because that's more efficient, and I am sending my wolf rider squads to go start patrolling in those provinces to bring the unrest back down, which is understandable because no one wants to pay the red tax, but when the red tax man comes a-knocking, it's kinda, you know, look, I'm not leaving without somebody's blood, you know? I've also started upgrading the fortress in this province to the next level, 
which is a fairly big bonus. If you look at the stats of the fortress, you get 15 administration at this level, which, which means there is a 7.5% bonus to the gold income of the province, and 15% of the resources will be sucked out of adjacent provinces. This should go up, I believe, to 45 at the next step, or there might be an interstitial step between, but it's a pretty significant bonus. Also, next turn, this guy will finish building this, and we'll get a nice little boost to this income as well. We've also had our first Scrati recruited. I'm sending him south to start site searching immediately because we'll need those water gems. But instead of continuing to recruit Scrati, I'm spending one turn to recruit commanders so that I can actually put together some decent armies to send north. As soon as I'm ready to do that, we'll start doing that. I'm also gathering up all of these random troops to bring back to the capital to assign to those commanders, which is also where this guy is going. The site searching also continues. And we should have enough wolves for three wolf squads within a couple more turns. I can be a bit more careless with the positioning of those wolf squads because basically they can travel so fast that they can catch up with the front line from wherever they are. So one final thing I want to mention, which is that I have done a little bit of sleuthing and I've tried to figure out what these thrones are. I thought briefly this might have been the throne of fire because it has fire snakes. However, it's led by a Netera of kings, which is a different deal. I'm really not sure what this province might be. There's any number of them that it could be, to be honest. However, this one is almost certainly the throne of Gaia or the throne of life. This one over here is definitely the, the throne of fire because it's, you know, ruled by a solar serpent. And, uh, you know, they're usually on theme. And this one over here, I actually suspect is the Outer Throne. None of the thrones are associated with the undead, but that province is full of undead. However, it's ruled by three mortal spellcasters, a human wizard and two human sorcerers. The Outer Throne produces astral gems, which is associated with like pure magic, so it makes sense that that might be the one that that is. Gaining one of the elemental thrones would be very useful, especially the Throne of Fire. If I can get a hold of that, that would be great, because that would give me fire access, which I don't actually have at the moment. I have one point of fire on my god, but he's too important to really waste his time doing, doing actual fire things. Anyway, that should be everything for this turn. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, and share. I also stream regularly on Twitch, and you can find me on Twitter for updates and announcements. If you want to contribute to my continued existence, then why not donate to me on Ko-fi or Patreon? All of the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching.